Thank you for joining us this morning here at the Heritage Foundation in our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our Heritage.org website on all of these occasions. Would remind everyone here in-house, if you will make that courtesy check to see that cell phones have been turned off, it is appreciated. And our internet viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments simply e emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. <coughs> Hosting our discussion today is Mike Frank. Mr. Frank oversees Heritage's work to help members of Congress understand and defend conservative principles in exercising their constitutional powers. He has served previously working here at Heritage as Director of Communications for House Majority Leader Dick Army of Texas, and prior to that was Heritage's Director of Congressional Relations. He has also served in the Office of National Drug Control Policy as a Legislative Counsel for former Representative uh, William Dannenmeyer of California, and as we were saying out in the lobby, also has his law degree, so he'll keep us tracked on that too. Thank you for joining us, and please <coughs> welcome Mike Frank. Thank you, John. And before we get started, um, we would like you to join us in a moment of silence for the victims of yesterday's bombings in, in Boston. Thank you. Uh, welcome to today's discussion. <coughs> it's uh, a <coughs> excuse me, Congressional Guide to Cybersecurity: Seven Steps to U.S. Security, Prosperity, and Freedom. It's a heritage backgrounder that you should have available both in hard copy and, um, and online, of course. And that's the, the basis for today's um, today's discussion. We have three um, very prominent experts in this field, and they are. Uh, I think it's very timely to be talking about this as well as other security threats, obviously. Um, let me just introduce them in order in which they will speak, and I'll do it all now, and then you guys can get up there. If you want to stay there, that's fine, too, to make it informal, uh, to deliver your remarks, and then we'll have time for questions and answers. Our first speaker is Dr. Stephen P. Bucci, who's the director of our Allison Center for Foreign Policy Studies. Uh, Steve brings over 30 years of expertise in national security matters at the highest levels of our government from 2001 to 2005. He served as the military assistant to the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld. He reviewed all of the Secretary's uh, intelligence uh, information during that time. He subsequently served as staff director of the immediate office of the Secretary of Defense and the deputy assistant secretary of defense, homeland defense, and defense support to civil authorities. I love those nice, pithy titles short. that the Pentagon offers. <laughs> Steve's also an adjunct professor at George Mason University, an associate professor at Long Island University in terrorism studies and cybersecurity policy. And you may note a Long Island accent on Steve when he speaks. And additionally, he serves on the advisory board of MIT's Geospatial Data Center, Center and is an advisor to the Prince of Wales Prince Edward Fellows at MIT and Harvard. Our second speaker will be uh, Kirsten Todd. She's currently president and CEO of Liberty Group Ventures, which develops and executes risk management strategies for Fortune 500 companies, state and local governments, sports stadiums, campuses, and colleges and universities. Previously, in addition to other consulting roles, Kirsten worked for uh, Sandia National Laboratories and worked for, with the California Governor's Office and Bay Area Economic Forum to develop the Homeland Security Preparedness Plan for the Bay Area. Ms. Todd was also an adjunct lecturer at Stanford University. She served as a professional staff member on the U.S. Senate Committee on Government, Governmental Affairs, now called the Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs. Uh, she worked there for uh, former Senator uh, Joe Lieberman of Connecticut. Before working in the Senate, Ms. Todd served in the Vice, in Vice President Gore's Domestic Policy Office. And batting cleanup, so to speak, is Paul Rosenzweig, who helped craft policy and strategy inside the Department of Homeland Security. And he brings that expertise back to the Her Heritage Foundation now as a visiting fellow. He's the founder of the Washington, D.C.-based Red Branch Consulting, which provides legal and strategic advice on national security and pri privacy concerns to individuals, companies, and governments. Previously, Rosenzweig was Senior Legal Research Fellow in our Heritage Foundation Center for Legal and Judicial Studies and a Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy in the Department of Homeland Security and Acting Assistant Secretary for International Affairs. He's written a number of books. The most recent one relevant to today is, is a very current, in which we did a book event on recently, Cyber Warfare, How Conflicts in Cyberspace Are Challenging America and Challenging the World. 
He's a senior editor for the Journal of National Security, Law, and Policy, and a professional lecturer in law at the George Washington University School of Law here in Washington, D.C. So you can see we have three very, very well credentialed experts to talk about today's topic. Steve, you want to start? Okay. Yes. Actually, I think we have three people. It don't seem like they can keep a job. <laughs> We've had lots of positions. Uh, welcome, everyone, here. Uh, I, I realize that the world is rightfully somewhat distracted by other things today than, than cybersecurity. Uh, we recognize the point of where this particular topic falls in importance, at least today. Uh, but I have to tell you, uh, we need to take action. This is a subject that needs to be dealt with. Uh, to be frank, there is no solution to the, the issue of cybersecurity. But we got to get a little closer to that than, than we are today. Uh, the threats out there are real. Uh, they're not hyped. It is not just some thing that's swirling around within the beltway so that big contracting companies can make a lot of money. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of people out there trying to make a lot of money on the subject, but that's kind of the way our system works. But the, the threats are, in fact, real. Uh, China, everybody seems to be aware of. Uh, Russia, most people sort of ignore. They're actually more sophisticated than the Chinese at cyber uh, techniques. Iran, nowhere near as sophisticated as the other two, but with a lot more malice because they're not as tied to us economically as, as China and Russia are. North Korea even has uh, some capabilities that are, are potentially dangerous to us. Uh, I, I have disagreements with some experts in town about the importance of terrorism in the cyber realm, but I have to tell you, it isn't an issue of a terrorist sitting there and taking <coughs> down the entire network in the United States. It's something like, imagine yesterday's terrible events, except right before it happens, someone hacks the Boston City 911 system and closes it down, uh, or hacks the Boston PD Fire Department EMT communications network, and suddenly assets that were not right at the spot don't get the word that they need to go to that spot. Uh, and it, it quickly ratchets up the, uh, the, the effect of that event. Uh, and then there's criminals who are out there trying to steal things left and right. Uh, I want to just touch real quickly on the, the seven points that we make in this paper of what needs to be in what we feel would be an effective piece or pieces of cyber legislation. I'm not going to explain each one of them because we don't have time to do that, and I want to leave something for my colleague Paul to discuss, but I'm going to hit on a few things real quickly. Uh, the first one is we need to enable information sharing. We've got to get it right. You can't mandate it by regulation. That will not work. Uh, the, the, we've got to anonymize the information that is shared as much as possible. That's tough to do today. Uh, we need to indemnify those who do share information with the government or with other <coughs> companies for having done that sharing. We need to free that information from potential FOIA requests. I don't know if you realize that, but once information gets in the hands of the feds, anybody can request it. Uh, so you, you want to allow companies to be able to share freely without fear of losing that information to a competitor or a uh, some other entity, and we need to make the sharing truly two-way. We've got to make sure that the federal government gives back as readily, as quickly, as effectively as they get the information. Uh, the other points uh, are we need to develop a cybersecurity insurance industry, if you will. We need to do a better job at enabling cybersecurity supply chain uh, uh, capabilities. We need to designate and very carefully delineate some degree of cyber self-protection that is legal so that companies who have the capability can actually take steps to protect themselves. And this is simply because the federal government and other law enforcement agencies do not have enough capability to do that for all the people they're supposed to protect. But we've got to do it within reason. It's not a free fire zone. Um, we need to improve awareness, education, and training for the general public. 
we need to really work on developing a cyber workforce, not just STEM education, but we need to reform things like security clearance practices so that that kid who had a little trouble for hacking into his high school's computers when he was 17 years old can actually get a security clearance later on because we need him and we need his skills. Uh, and then lastly, we need to uh, touch on, on getting involved more effectively in the international engagement on cybersecurity. And I'm going to just touch a little more on two of those. Uh, one is the awareness, education, and training. This is the, the mom and apple pie of cybersecurity. Everybody agrees we need more of it. Uh, but frankly, the, the federal government has not followed through sufficiently and at the kind of depth that we need to really touch the American people. Uh, we, there's been a comment made, uh, you'll recognize this, Kirsten, Kirsten uh, that it's, uh, you can't make everybody a computer engineer. Well, that's a very true statement. It's also irrelevant. You don't need to make everyone in America a computer engineer. But there is a hunger out there for people to know what the issues are in cybersecurity, to understand them sufficiently to be able to protect themselves. I would refer you to the Mandiant report that came out on China and the cybersecurity. If you look at that, the majority of things that those Chinese hackers were doing isn't some big, fancy, technological, advanced, persistent threat thing. It was old-fashioned you know, social engineer, socially engineered emails. So people who were not wise enough not to click on those things got burnt, and then their entities got burnt. So there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that we can fix by that awareness, education, and training for the general public that we don't do enough of and we don't do well enough. And then the last point I'll make is on this international engagement. I have to tell you, I was reluctant to put that in this paper because I was concerned that there is a trend in, in some circles here in Washington that they essentially want to do arms control for cyber things. You know, they want to sign a treaty that says everybody will be nice to each other on the Internet. Uh, you know, good luck with that. Arms control doesn't work with nuclear weapons and missiles, frankly. That's my opinion. It will not work with cyber at all, and it's a waste of time to do that. However, there is today a growing divide internationally between countries like ours and, and other democracies around the world who want a free Internet, who want the entire world to have access to the benefits of using cyber technologies, and a group of countries who are very much against that who want to lock down the Internet, who want to use it as a means to control their populations, uh, to control religious discourse, to control political discourse, and we have to win that argument. We cannot let those forces of repression win that, and the only way we can do that is for our representatives to get involved in the international fora to, uh, to make that point that Internet freedom is really the way to go forward. Uh, and with that out there to stir you up, I will give the floor to my colleagues. Thank you, Steve. Uh, great to be here to, to talk about this issue, which is so critical, and to respond to, uh, to this paper, which I think really gets out an intellectual argument and a set of assertions um, that continues to move this ball forward. Um, with the executive order out, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, there's a lot of momentum around this. Um, but there's an interesting element to cyber. So uh, as was mentioned, I was on the Hill uh, before, during, and after 9-11, and was part of the team that drafted the legislation to create the Department of Homeland Security. And that momentum right after 9-11 was very much about how do we make sure this never happens again? We never want to deal with this again. And so what are we going to do as a country? What are we going to legislate to prevent? Very much of a sentiment that we are feeling and seeing up in Boston. We're not going to let this happen again. The Boston, the Boston Athletic Association better gear up for two, three times as many entries next year um, looking at this. But what we understand and what we understood in that, um, and actually you're hearing it this morning from a lot of the officials up in Boston, is it is not about prevention. There's a shift in thinking. It is about resiliency. Things are going to happen. Um, you know, what we realized is that whether it's terrorism, whether it is a tsunami, whether it's an earthquake or hurricane, 
we're going to be faced with all sorts of events. And so our efforts, while prevention, you never want to neglect prevention, our efforts need to look at recovery, response, and resilience. And how do we ensure that our infrastructure is as resilient as possible? That was a, an intellectual evolution that happened after 9-11 from which we can learn. Um, because the issue with cyber is, you know, the, I bring up 9-11 and the DHS legislation is because that is of a similar significance when you're talking about the destruction that cybersecurity and cyber uh, espionage, hacking can do to our country. But it's not truly realized. And the challenge is, is we probably won't have a cyber event, a cyber 9-11, a digital 9-11, that will be the actual, the trigger that gets everybody to say, oh wow, you know, we need to have something really significant. Because that's just not the nature of cyber. We actually had some pretty serious things happen last year, the attacks on the U.S. financial institutions. When you look at Saudi Aramco, I mean, that was a devastation that we had never seen. It was not only the theft of intellectual property and data, but it destroyed 30,000 computers. And the U.S. financial institution attacks in the fall, they weren't sequential. They happened simultaneous they, and after they started to happen. And it happened at a scale and a speed that we had never seen before. So when we are looking at cyber, it is, prevention is critical. That is always a part of crisis management. But we really need to be looking at how do we ensure that our infrastructure, our cyber infrastructure, is as resilient as it can be? And what do we need to do that? And the challenge is, is that we continue to underestimate the risk that cyber presents to us, both in our industries, in our industries and our sectors and companies. Companies may have a cyber policy. They have CISOs now versus IT departments. They have CIOs um, versus just the technical people. But we're still underestimating the cyber risk that we're feeling. And so what can we do to ensure that we're creating a cyber infrastructure, a resilient cyber infrastructure? So in looking at the paper and the seven suggestions, I, you know, it's funny, Steve, that you said the, the international one was one that you were reluctant, because that was the first one I was going to call out. Because, you know, like crises and natural and man-made disasters, they know no jurisdictions. You know, they don't stop at county lines, they don't stop at city lines or state lines. And cyber is that way tenfold, because you can hack a, a, a country, a company from your bedroom. You don't have to go out, you can do, and you can do it internationally. And so there is a real need on the international front to come together with cooperation and for the U.S. to take a role in both sharing what it knows from a vulnerability perspective as well as what it's doing and what it's doing well. So I, I, I think the, the international component is really is, is quite important. The research and development and training individuals to get to, uh, to get to that place where they can thoughtfully contribute to this discussion is, is also quite important. But there are two that um, I particularly want to focus on, which I think you know, we've talked a lot about. Um, the first is information sharing. So information sharing has been the crux of a lot of cyber policy and debate. And how do we share information? How do we incentivize? And the executive order that was released in February by the president talks about some of the, how do we encourage voluntary information sharing. But I want to take that one step further. Once we share that information, what are we going to do with it? And that is a critical element, I think, that starts to look at how do we incentivize the information sharing. Because we have to understand what are we asking people to share and for what purpose. And without a doubt, the, the um, idea that's presented in this paper about FOIA helping protect companies from that liability of sharing information, I think, is really critical. And it, it needs to be looked at and examined in any legislation. The second part is looking at standards and regulations. There is no element in our society today that deals with safety and security for which the government is not involved. It, implicit in safety and security is a governmental role. And when we're looking at cybersecurity, we tend to see this on uh, two ends of the spectrum. We're talking about absolutely no regulation or we've got, we're burdened by regulation. But there's a middle ground here. I mean, if we talk about, if we look at the seatbelt law, you know, when the seatbelts came in, and people talk about this all the time, there was this infringement of, you know, <coughs> personal privacy, I, don't tell me what to do in my car. I don't, you know, I'll, I'll make the choices that are right for me. It turns out to be one of the greatest safety measures we have as a country in requiring people to wear a seatbelt. And so when we look at where standards can come in, and I think there's a, there's a connotation and a difference between standards and regulations, but looking at the role that standards can play in the middle, it's allowing the government to engage, not as the ceiling, but as the floor. 
And so creating a template of standards, of baseline standards, mitigation strategies that we know work and work well, and imposing them in legislation to ensure that we have a foundation. It's not a foundation that restricts innovation, that restricts technology development, but it's a foundation upon which that can actually occur because you're not waiting for people to catch up to that baseline. It actually encourages efficiency because we're telling everybody, this is what we know and what works well. This is, this is agile, flexible technology, standards, baseline sets of mitigation strategies that can work. Now it's our responsibility to build off of them and to do something with it. A president doesn't come to an administration, start an administration with a uh, foreign policy agenda. He or she comes with a domestic policy agenda. The challenge is, is that agenda gets disrupted. And you look at what's happening in North Korea, you look at um, all of these issues that are happening around the world, even the Iranian earthquake this morning. However, that's going to affect us as a tragedy. And now you look at Boston. There are things that happen to us all the time, but what we are starting to see, and as Steve pointed out, there is a cyber threat to all of this. We don't need to see them in silos. What happened in Boston is, is a cyber threat. Rest assured that those first responders, those people that are looking, the, the, the uh, 800 numbers that are getting set up to help find loved ones, <coughs> what's ha what the FBI is doing right now, they are, they are depending on a database, they are depending on resources, they are depending on international and national partnerships to get information. And the cybersecurity, uh, the safety of uh, the infrastructure, the resiliency of that, of that infrastructure is so critical. And so we are going to get distracted as a nation over the course of time, next 6, 12, 18 months, around all sorts of things. But we cannot lose sight of this issue, and we cannot lose sight of its, its importance. I brought up 9-11 at the beginning because I think cybersecurity and our ability to manage it, to protect it, to ensure that we have resilient cyber infrastructure becomes as critical as what we would do to respond to our physical infrastructure and that inextricable link. And so we, those of us who have been working on it, those of us who continue to work on it, have to keep our heads down and continue this call to action to do something with it. And it's coming into the middle on what can be passed, not as a diluted uh, set of standards, but as something that actually gives the foundation for a lot to grow from. So I think you know, this paper that uh, Paul and Steve wrote is a, a great starting point for what that legislation could be and also just for what action could be. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. And David, too. And David. <laughs> David just, just, I'm glad you came because I wanted the international piece in. So <laughs> I'm here to help. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, that that it's a good thing that you were you were here to to tell Steve that I was right and he was wrong. I, I, can, uh, I conceded it. Was yeah, right. I, but, no, but um, I changed my mind. Yeah. Well, no, but I'm glad. Um, well, there's much to talk about in terms of um, of an of a guide to Congress for cyber legislation. Uh, I want to uh, take a few minutes here and talk about some of the things that I think ought to be in legislation that are missing from the current sets of conversation, right? Uh, which is to say that uh, information sharing is in there. It's important. I agree it's in our paper as well. Um, and different forms of it are in every one of the bills. So if we ever do get a bill, about which I, I fear I have some skepticism, um, you know, they, uh, uh, some form of information sharing will be in it. It'll, whether it's closer to the Senate version or the House version is, is up to the conference. Um, uh, uh, so uh, likewise, the House last year and the Senate last year uh, stood strong for better education and mostly in the STEM range, but again, we're not going to, we're not going to see a bill that doesn't have that in it. What are some of the things that we, that we don't see in the current sets of bills that, that ought to be there? Um, I was going to say this, but I'll skip it because you mentioned it. First, resilience as, as a concept, right? If we look at the regulatory portions of the Senate bills, they're all about prevention, prepare and prevent, and that's the old kind of Maginot line way of thinking about cyber, um, uh, the reality of cyber, as with the reality of, uh, of conventional terrorism or conventional action, is that the systems will fail at some point. Uh, Boston said that yesterday in the, in the physical world. Um, you know, Shamoon in, in, in Saudi Aramco says that in the, in the cyber world just as readily. So what the right sort of uh, standard setting would be, from my judgment, 
that is absent from any conception in the executive order or in the or in the proposals on the hill are standard setting about appropriate resilience capacities right what what sorts of things do you need to think about in terms of diversity of operating systems segregation of of uh, of, uh, of control uh, systems from uh, public facing systems, backups. There's a whole host of best practices that might be uh, worthy of consideration, most of which are utterly absent right now from, from the bills in the consideration. So, so that's one piece that I'd really like to see get in there. Um, a second piece that's missing, also mentioned in our paper, is any real consideration of supply chain security. Uh, we are uh, obsessed with uh, uh, software hacking as the, uh, as the gravest threat. And uh, probably as a matter of current practice, that's right. But if we're talking about the types of threats that are more likely to be um, uh, insidious and at the higher end of threat from uh, significant peer state actors who are uh, uh, intent upon doing malicious work, um, Hardware intrusions are as likely, if not more likely, to have catastrophic effects as software intrusions, uh, at least in part because the hardware inside is mostly, is much more pervasive. 97%, 98% of our chips are manufactured overseas, uh, many in countries with whom we have tense relationships at best. And we've seen demonstrations of the capability um, to, affect, um, to affect through hardware um, actual uh, actual uh, changes in the operation of systems. Used to be when I was, a, I came out of government in 2009, used to be I couldn't talk about that because government hadn't publicly acknowledged it, but fortunately the Department of Homeland Security has testified publicly that this is a realistic capability so we can speak to it at some length. Um, what does it mean to have a secure supply chain? It's not, a, you, you can't eliminate the overseas purchase of chips, right? Uh, we're never going to do that. Uh, what it means is identifying some super critical systems and making sure that you uh, maybe buy your hardware from domestic production foundries for those. I'm, I'm, for me, that's like the nuclear codes, uh, the systems that run the nuclear codes for our missiles and things like that. And then for the rest of it, it's um, rules and standards about having to know your vendor, right? Uh, what physical security is, who owns that company, what um, where, uh, where their uh, production facilities are, what they do to screen their workers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that doesn't guarantee you a, uh, a, better set of, uh, a, a better set of chips any more than we can guarantee uh, code safety either, but it guarantees you better visibility into what you're, you're looking at. And, you know, in my perspective, that's not really uh, what, what, what the legislation needs to do is not make that a federal responsibility right, because the federal government in terms of that kind of analysis is not nimble enough, but rather uh, authorize or uh, the creation of uh, some sorts of private sector, you know, grading systems. In the paper we talk about UL, uh, uh, underwriters, laboratories, as, as a model, um, and that's the type of thing that doesn't exist right now. Um, and uh, if, uh, if the regulatory underbrush is cleared away, we would be a great uh, add-on. That's not sexy is the problem with it, right? Everybody wants to write legislation that is all about, you know, fighting with the Chinese or, or, uh, or something like that. But that's not, um, that's not the sexy piece of it all. Um, um, the other piece that I think uh, is missing from our discussion um, uh, is... Uh, is the concept of liability. Uh, liability, and this would apply, I think, in the, in the software realm as much as in the hardware realm, um, which is to say, uh, you know, uh, it used to, the, uh, the joke used to be, right, you know, that if you owned a car and it stopped every 16 miles and you had to reboot it, by turning it off and turning it on, we'd, we'd never put up with that, right? Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, that, that's not, uh, uh, the, and, and we don't have to, in part because if any, if any car manufacturer produced that kind of product, not only would people not buy it, but if they did, you know, uh, there'd, be li there'd be some liability for consequential damages. Um, uh, there was a recent case, uh, one of the first of its kind up in New England, about a bank that ignored uh, warning alerts about uh, access to a, a small company's bank account, and uh, after ignoring it, transferred all that money 
um, in the company's bank account to an anonymous bank account in Romania, whereof it was never, you know, never seen again. The company lost the money. Who should be responsible? Where should the loss fall? Does it fall on, uh, I mean, in general, up until now, our rule has been it falls on the user, the customer, who uh, the bank says, sorry, we, we disclaimed liability for that. You're responsible. Um, you know, uh, and, uh, and the court said no. No, there's a burden of commercially reasonable behavior. This was two commercial companies, so that's, that was the standard. That obliges uh, the bank to at least answer for whether or not its decision to disregard the alerts it, it received was a reasonable one, right? And, and I think that's an appropriate way to develop uh, cybersecurity standards. I think it's more likely to be nimbler than uh, the, uh, the government standard setting mechanisms, which I think take too long and will not create, um, uh, will create, will wind up creating standards that, uh, while good right now, will be out of date in three years because of, uh, uh, because the technology changes so rapidly and dynamically. Uh, on the other hand, if you set a, reason, a commercially reasonable set of standards, then that mutates as, as the commercial reasonableness mutates, as new products come online. You know, there's a cost-benefit analysis that goes into that. Now, um, this is strange, right, coming from a conservative heritage to actually be talking about the possibility of using common law liability. Um, but the problems in common law liability that we at Heritage tend to think are, are the difficult parts aren't the basic notions that somebody should be responsible for their own unreasonable behavior or their own negligence. It's the encrustations that have gone on top of that. Large-scale class action suits where the victims don't get any money, but the tort lawyers get a lot of money. Fee-shifting statutes where lawyers sue just to make money for themselves instead of to, to create, uh, to create um, uh, value for the victims. Turgid civil, civil uh, processes. And, and I'll grant you that, that's, that those are problems for the idea of liability as a solution. But the bottom line here is that, um, you know, right now, right now, um, Nobody is responsible for cybersecurity failures that are something within their control. The loss completely falls on the end user, you, me, the customer of the bank. Um, and that's the wrong place for it to, to, to fall. I mean, I was at a conference on Friday in Stanford, and one of the techies there, a very famous man named Whit Diffie, by the way, in case anybody knows his name, was saying, you know, some of the security vulnerabilities we've known about for 40 years, right? Uh, they're built into the system, and we can fix them. It's just that nobody's ever had an economic incentive to do it. Now, you can either mandate that through a, a, a congressional uh, standard setting and hope that the, that the standard setting process at NIST gets it right, or you can just uh, enunciate a general principle of liability and um, let the common law system develop that, the answers over time as well. I would like to at least see a discussion begin about that. And I have two more minutes, so I'll add one more. And this is not in this paper, but is in another paper that I wrote a couple, about a year and a half ago, um, which is, you know, Steve started off the discussion uh, with uh, of the list of all the state actors who we're afraid of, and that, yeah, and we're in contention with them. That's, uh, I don't disagree with any of that. Um, but we need to come the next level down and think about not just terrorists, but the uh, internet hacker community, some of whom are very much forces for good in the world, um, some of whom are, however, uh, forces of uh, ranging from vandalism to anarchism, you know, on a spectrum. And it strikes me that those groups are a lot like an insurgency in a lot of ways. Not a nation state, but a, but a kind of guerrilla group that, ha that is motivated by an ideological commitment to something. Um, and what we need uh, is a counterinsurgency strategy in cyberspace, one that deals with uh, hackers, at, you know, it, not as a unitary body that just needs to be acted upon in the same, with the same uh, sets of rules as we're going to apply even to North Korea, China, Russia, or Iran, but with their own set of needs and desires. And we don't have a any approach to that at all. Um, uh, that's probably not a legislative mandate, <clears throat> so much as Congress looking to uh, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Defense, the Department of Commerce and Justice and saying, what is your strategy here? Come back to us in, eight, in, in six months and tell us what it is, and then we'll talk about it. So that's an oversight role for Congress rather than a legislative role. And with that, I think I've chewed mm -hmm. up my 10 minutes, and we'll open up the questions. 
I want it on record that I didn't say that we should hunt down hackers and kill them. No, I didn't say that either. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll take the prerogative of the chair and just ask the panel uh, panelists one quick question. Of all the different areas you addressed today, and you spend most of your time talking about problems and how to try to fix them, what is the one thing that keeps you guys awake at night? What is the one threat, or one scenario that might put the fear of God in you, um, give you night sweats and, and all that nice stuff? Steve? Uh, well, keep in mind, I used to be a Green Beret in the Army, so I tend to think like a bad guy. Uh, <laughs> I, it, yes, please don't have to stand up. Uh, it, what really bothers me is when you look at a, a Mumbai, India-style attack, so take the bombings that occurred yesterday, but throw in a bunch of guys and gals running around with guns in various venues around a city or a couple of cities, uh, and you enable that, as I mentioned, by taking down the, the 911 system of that particular city, because most of us have no concept of how dependent we are on that 911 system. When we call for the good guys, we expect them to show up in darn near light speed, and God bless them, most of the time they do. Uh, if you took that down, you would create such chaos in, in one of our communities. Uh, it, it would really, really be devastating. Now. We have a much better responder community than, than they did in India. Uh, it took them quite a while to get their act together before they could go after those guys. Our guys would respond much more quickly, I believe, much more effectively than that if they can get the word as to where to go <coughs> and what they need there to, to do that response. You take that kind of communications capability away, which post 9-11, when we had the big problem with com communications among responders, we fixed it but it's almost all 100% internet-based communication now. If you take that down through some enabling cyber event, uh, you really put a hurt on our capability to respond. And that, that's a very likely one, very low-tech, low-speed, easily executed scenario. And the level of our vulnerability to that is? It's, that is the single biggest worry of most big city mm -hmm. police departments. Yeah. So it's it's... It's a vulnerability. Hey, Kirsten? I think um, maybe building off of that is uh, sequential attacks. The thing about cybersecurity is it allows things to happen in sequence at a rapid speed. And when we do tabletop exercises, which are <coughs> scenarios that you know look at uh, particular crises or disasters, the, the way to really challenge and, and burden a system is to have one event followed by another event. And that is challenging to do when you're talking about physical. Um, we saw it yesterday in Boston a little bit, and if you talk to some of the, um, if you listen to what some of the uh, eyewitnesses said, there was that initial fear of, okay, there was one, there was two, where's the third one coming from, where's the fourth one coming from, and that fear and paranoia, similar to 9-11. And the cyber, ability to do that in, in cyber, because of cyber, and to do it so easily without any trace, to me is, is one of the greatest fears, because you can have that compounding effect, which absolutely burdens any type of emergency response infrastructure. Um, so I would say that that's something that we, which is why it goes to the resilient infrastructure, because if you build redundancy into your systems, then if some part gets taken down, right. another part gets get, can, can uh, resume and, and work and step right. in where it needs to be, so. Okay. Paul? <clears throat> I'm going to take a different tack, and, and, I, and I'm not actually sure that this would be my number one, but uh, as much for the value of, you know, uh, creating some discussion. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that uh, my biggest fear in the long term is uh, that we break the golden goose, right? That we kill the golden goose. There are many security measures out there um, that seem reasonable in the small and in the fine, but uh, when layered one on top of the other might wind up making um, uh, the proliferation of cyberspace capabilities uh, more difficult, more costly, in some cases impossible. I mean, the reason that the vulnerabilities are so great is precisely because the network is such an open um, uh, structure that anybody can hook anything onto it. And that has, I mean, we should not lose sight of the fact that that has created a, an immense, uh, an immense uh, increase in value in, a, in the world. You know, 
productivity has grown, two and a half billion people tied to the network, a trillion things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, some of the solutions that we might um, engage in could actually break the network, fracture it into pieces, uh, uh, impose new protocols of, of security that slow growth or make growth impossible or, or lead people to exile themselves to free parts of the network instead of secure parts of the network. Um, the more we go down that road, uh, I worry about killing the goose and slaying the golden eggs. And, and, I, and I'm a security guy as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I really am a security guy, but there, there's a, we, we get so wrapped up it's in, in you know, the never again scenario and the, we've, we've got to be absolutely safe and, and the <coughs> difficulty of explaining to the American people if something bad does happen, no, no, we took all the reasonable steps, but no, you, can't, you can't not have the Boston Marathon, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you could do that, but then that, we've lost the game yeah. in the end. Um, everybody's using Boston as the metaphor today, and, and that's unfortunate and, and shouldn't be seen as disrespectful. But that's, that's actually mm -hmm. one of my big fears. Mm -hmm. okay. The other one, if I had to say, was what if you turned on your computer and it turned against you? <laughs> no, no, the, hard, the hardware problem yeah. inside. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought you meant something out of an Arlen, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. Um, Ooh, that's okay, coming. We can now turn to uh, questions, and for the benefit of our panelists, please just <clears> identify <throat> your yourself and your affiliation. So who would like to ask the first question? Oh, come on. I may call on one of you guys. <laughs> oh, the, camera, oh, the, 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 camera. the cameraman wants yes. to ask a question. Yeah. Why not? I have a question for uh, Dr. Pucci. Uh, on the outset, you said you were not in favor of an uh, arms control type of uh, international agreement uh, you know, on cybersecurity. Could you talk, in the context of U.S.-China relationship, mm -hmm. could you talk about your disfavor for that kind of thing? Maybe other panelists can, you know, mm -hmm. express their opinion. Why it's not a good idea to talk to China, for example, to have this kind of agreement. No, I, I, didn't say, I didn't say we shouldn't talk to China. We need to talk to China. We need to talk to all the countries that are out there that are big players on the Internet, and China clearly is, is a huge one just in the, the volume of, of users and and its capabilities. I am just not terribly in favor of trying to sign an agreement that says, yea, verily, the signatories will not do this, 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 and this, when we all know they're, they're going to turn right around and do it. Verification, you know, the traditional problem of verification in, in old-fashioned arms control is huge. Uh, it's pretty much impossible in the cyber realm. So while it'd be nice to shake hands and agree on all that stuff, if anybody took any particular comfort from it, this is not aimed at China, it's aimed at anybody. Uh, you know, if, if they really think that those countries, once they make a decision that some action is in their national interest to do, just because they've said they're not gonna do it on that piece of paper, you're dreaming. Uh, and, and like I say, that, that's not a slam on China. I'd, I'd say the same thing about an agreement with any country. Uh, I just don't think arms control works, and it definitely doesn't work for, for cyber. I think we should be talking with all those countries based on that very different vision of the Internet that I talked about. And my friend Paul yeah. is chomping at yeah. the bit no, to jump. No, <laughs> I mean, the, 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 uh, there's, a, there's another reason as, as well, which is, that, uh, which is what I alluded to at the end, which is that this space is not limited to state actors. We can have an arms control treaty with Russia, about nuclear missiles, because the only people in the world who have nuclear missiles are us, the Russians, the British, the French, you know, a bunch of nation states. We can have a cyber arms control treaty with China, and even if China, Russia, and everybody actually abides by it, there's absolutely <coughs> no uh, way that we can guarantee that the non-state actors will abide by it. I mean, you, the, the best example of this was just, uh, what, three weeks ago? There was a, a, a Dutch uh, company called Spam House, which is in the business, of the, the good guy business, of listing and blacklisting um, people who host spammers, right? And, and Spam House is a, is a, it's non, it's a non-governmental entity, but they've collected this information. They've got a great reputation for being accurate and honest, and they will say, okay, this block of IP addresses that's being operated by this company over here, that's just a source of trillions of, of, of email spams a day. Everybody in the world, you should... You should make those IP addresses dark. So they th did that to a group called uh, Cyber Block, Cyber Blockhouse, Cyber Blockhouse, um, uh, who are, by the way, 
I'm sorry, Heritage, you may get attacked today, but who are indeed the spammer, we have mega spammers in the world. But Cyber Blockhouse counterattacked. Cyber Bunker, that's it, Cyber Bunker, sorry. Cyber Bunker counterattacked. And what they did was they didn't counterattack just at Spam House, they counterattacked against the actual switching functions of the network, and they started flooding not Spam House itself, but the, the top level server domains in Europe. Uh, with 3,000 gigabits per second, which, by the way, is a huge amount of, of spam data, um, blocking traffic going to Spam House, and, oh, by the way, slowing down the entire network for much of northeast, northern Europe, right? So, and this is a group of, on the order of 20 people, right? Very high level, uh, you know, sophisticated uh, capabilities, um, mostly, you know, in it for criminality and spamality and, and not, they, they, the cyber bunker says the only thing they won't host is, is child pornography, which, you know, tells you basically how far down the road that is, but how much else they'll host. Um, you know, so, so what good's a treaty with China, even if China agrees to abide by it, right, if cyber bunker doesn't? I mean, that's the first time in the history of the Heritage Foundation the word spamality was used at an event, so. Uh, who else has a question? Yes, sir. Get, get, get to mic. Hi, I'm Nikulia with the Austrian Embassy. I was wondering um, how, you, how you see the role of companies like Huawei in the context of domestic cybersecurity? Huawei. Thank you. Huawei. 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 So, if you're looking at how those companies play in, in cyber, I mean, interesting what Paul was saying when he gave his remarks about um, the role of, of companies and what they can do. And I think um, this goes really to the idea of international cooperation and, and collaboration getting international standards. Um, there are companies around the world that are supplying um, technology and, and uh, information all to, to governments and others, and if we can develop a template, an international template of uh, private sector as well as public sector standards for how they how they act and how they are implement how their um, how their products are implemented and and what goes into them, then I think we've got a better shot of looking at it again to this baseline set of security standards. Um, but I think that. There are, it, it's, a, it's a sensitive topic in how we manage this on an international and global front. <coughs> I actually feel sorry for Huawei. <coughs> I mean, I, I, I don't know whether they're in cahoots with the Chinese government or not. I know that the suspicion is a bit reasonable <coughs> and that they've been unable or unwilling to answer some of the questions that the U.S. Congress has for them. But I feel sorry for them because they are... Um, the first victims of um, the Chinese government's uh, own very aggressive actions in cyberspace, right? Uh, and so they're getting tarred with the same brush uh, because of the possibility of their connection. Uh, I have, if, if there was not nearly, if there was no evidence of China's ongoing cyber espionage activities in the United States, Huawei probably wouldn't be having problems entering the market and wouldn't be the subject of this, this discussion, you wouldn't be asking the question. So they are, like sometimes American companies are, kind of, you know, catching flack for the actions of their own government with which they may or may not, you know, have any role in. Uh, and so part of me feels a little sorry for them. The other part of me says, well, given what we know, it's an absolutely reasonable set of precautions to be careful about uh, integrating them into any critical uh, in IT infrastructure that we're building, precisely because we do not know, and precisely because we have such great evidence that this is a, an, an asymmetric area in which China is, is trying to develop advantages. Just to add to that, that quickly, I mean, the, the challenge that Huawei has now is that no company, no non-Chinese company can if, if they bring that product into a client or do something like that, and then it, it, no one's going to take the risk on them. So I think going to, to Paul's point, I mean, there is a real interesting, they are definitely brushed with this, um, this the, there's, with what's going on with their government, and it's, it's a challenge for other, company, other companies that are looking at this on a global stage to take a risk on, a, on something that is uncertain. 
and it's uh, the other part. I mean, it's just it's technologically, if you will, impossible to to figure out if there's bad stuff in the hardware or not. I mean, if it's built in, it's pretty much impossible to find. There's no equivalent of you know, like sweeping this room for bugs and then saying, okay, we could have a classified conversation in here. You can't wave something <clears throat> around a, a computer or a set of servers and determine if there's something bad on it. And, you know, I don't, I don't think we're going to get to that point anytime in the near future. So that, that element of trust and the reputation of companies is huge. I mean, it's, it's worth billions and billions of dollars in either gained or lost revenue because of the markets you can can access. And uh, in this case, you know, Huawei is, is paying a price. We have a question from our online audience. William Werley asks, um, are business and cyber-related companies lobby in Congress to prevent the inhibiting legislation that Paul Rosenzweig is talking about? You want to maybe talk about the legislative situation and the, the kind of activity that it's generated on the Hill, both pro and and con. Well, there's there's massive lobbying on the Hill, as with, in any large bill there always is. Um, uh, there are, <clears throat> I would say, lots of different pieces going on. Um, the information sharing piece that we started this discussion with, most of the business community is lobbying in favor of because they want to be able to share thread information with each other, uh, and they feel <coughs> like they're prohibited from doing that now. The main vector of, a, of opposition to that right now is a group of, well, I think it's fairly fair to characterize civil libertarians and privacy groups who think that if the private sector shares information with themselves and or with the government, will be creating too much information and a big brother threat, right? On the regulatory side, um, the, the business uh, and the standard setting side, business is, has been aligned pretty much against that, through, especially through the U.S. Chamber of Commerce on the grounds that they don't know how much it'll cost and, um, and they are afraid of, of, uh, of standards that they can't meet um, and, and then probably of being liable for not meeting those standards. So a combination of what Kirsten was saying and what I was saying. Um, I don't know of anybody who's lobbying against um, uh, uh, better education and awareness no, or, STEM, cell, or <laughs> STEM education or, or international engagement. One of the other vehicles right now for um, not necessarily lobbying but communication is the, the request for information on the executive order. Um, I think they got over 160 responses. And what was interesting is entities like the chamber who had pushed back on certain things came out very much in support of what the EO was trying to do. And so I think it's, you know, people, there are the, there's a motivation around figuring out what to do and how to get on the right bandwagon. Um, and you're going to see a lot of input from companies, industries, and sectors. And the EO is going to be, an, uh, I think, a fascinating opportunity to witness how these different organizations engage on this topic and what they offer and what they're supporting. And just, just uh, this is a great point to, to make here, I think. You need to understand, cybersecurity is not a partisan issue. Every cyber bill that's been introduced, frankly, has had bipartisan support. And every one of them has had huge bipartisan opposition. Right? It's not a Republican-Democrat issue. There are, are legitimate differences among reasonable people as to what the best way there is to address these issues. Should it be regulatory? Should it not be regulatory? Should we leverage market forces? Should we take that part of it out of it? I mean, th these are legitimate discussions, and they come from all over the political spectrum. We need to have that national conversation. We, you know, and that's why I wasn't real thrilled with the EO because the president needs to let Congress fight this out, and and business needs to be involved in it to to get the expertise, to get the uh, the perspective of that. As should uh, companies and and think tanks who have a dog in the fight as well. We need to have this conversation. We need to work it out. If we don't do that, we're never going to be as effective on the international front as we'd like to be because we haven't figured out what we want here in America yet. Uh, you know, the, the privacy versus security debate, which in, in large measure is, is somewhat false because you can't ever really have privacy if you don't have at least some security. Uh, I mean, we're a democracy and we're all about this internal debate. 
it's the best system in the world, folks, but it isn't real fast when it comes to making contentious decisions. Uh, and, and we need to do that. We have time for one more question. Who else would uh, like to pick the brains of these three incredibly intelligent panelists? Uh, I had a question for Kirsten. I was just wondering if you could go into detail on what kind of standards you would like to see enacted. It's mm -hmm. a great question. <laughs> I was hoping I could get, just get off by using the, the blanket <laughs> statement of standards. Um, I, I think, you know, <laughs> looking at look, let's look at what the executive order is trying to do and I you know I take Steve's point that you know there's a frustration around it but truly the president needed to do something and so um, it was necessary but insufficient and it's it's a step that gets us going um, and I think the standards are where we've got to bring the the stakeholders involved to agree that we're coming in on the middle ground and so those standards would be around information sharing, incentivizing information sharing. I think a lot of the points that are laid out in the paper are part of that baseline. It, I, there's a, a subtle distinction that I think is critical, which is you want to create baseline standards, but that doesn't mean you're creating the least common denominator. Because what you want is a strong foundation that is agile to build off, to get the innovation, the technology, and, and the creativity and the interaction to build from that. And so specifically to me the best standards are going to be those that are be going to be formulated now by the key stakeholders in infrastructure from the ISACs from you know entities like SANS who are researching this and coming together in a new way what I what I don't think would be helpful is to regurgitate those that have caused the conflict some are going to um, some are going to sustain and persevere because they should but right now we are at an, an interesting time and I think tipping point because of the motivation around the EO, because of where people are coming, that cyber has become mainstream and it's not a, you know, the conference that gets put off to the side, it's, it's in the middle, that we can actually create those standards that are the foundation to build from. And I think the information sharing is, you know, is a component, but as I said, the, what the paper lays out, there are a lot of key elements in that that should be part of that foundation. Okay, with that, I think I'd like to uh, adjourn the panel and ask you to join me and give them a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.